Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. All right. I'm so excited today. We have one of the most well-loved American Ninja Warriors of all time and just amazing, amazing woman, fitness professional right here with us today. Angela Gargano is in the house. Hello, Angela. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my gosh. The pleasure is mine, as we say. We are so excited to have you with us today. Hey, just to kind of, most of us know you from, you know, I can't remember, was it four or five seasons? Too many seasons on American Ninja Warrior. So amazing. And then you've done so much since then. Give us kind of like a little bit more of the backstory too. Just tell us about Angela, where she came yeah, from. Yeah. I mean, I guess the quick backstory is um, I grew up in a really small town called Byram, New Jersey, not the Jersey that a lot of people think it's like in the woods. <laughs> We're known for having this this uh, activity called Wild West City. Um, so it's very much like in the woods growing up there. Um, and I was a gymnast growing up and decided that I was going to do college gymnastics. So I uh, went to Rhode Island College to do that. Did a division in three gymnastics there, which was absolutely amazing. Um, got my biological chemistry degree and w- started working in the industry after I got out of college. And then slowly started to realize I'm really missing fitness. I'm really missing some kind of movement. Started getting into fitness competitions, which eventually led me to getting so many titles that I can't even name them right now. Fitness competitions. uh, These were the competitions where you're like flipping around on stage and and then posing. So not like just the bodybuilding type situation. Cool. Um, The title of Miss Fitness America in 2016. And then I run it retiring from that, basically going into American Ninja Warrior. Um four times opening a gym within that time span. And then uh, on so season 10 of American Ninja Warrior, I went up tearing my ACL, um, which was uh, awful, but also a blessing uh. in disguise. Um, shut down the gym, moved to New York City, where I you know, worked with the best people in the industry, learned from the best. And that's where I started developing my love for teaching people pull-ups. And then it slowly shifted into putting everything online, um, and teaching primarily women how to do get their first pull up. And yeah, after, you know, after that, obviously pandemic hit and, you know, that was actually great for my business. I taught so many people their pull ups during the pandemic, but wound up um, getting out of the city and being nomadic for a while, traveling the world. And now I'm here in Austin, Texas. That's a very short rundown of a lot of the things that I've done. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, I, I would, this is awesome. I, I think I heard that, but you started in gymnastics as a gymnast, which is incredible. My wife is a gymnast and she, at the age of almost 50, can still do a back handsprings, you know? So you know what that is. A lot of people don't know what that is, but you know, she can do this tumbling, uh, I forget what you call it, a tumbling pattern or whatever. And she can end up with the back handspring. (laughs) It's pretty, pretty awesome. So my kids, they love you. They love the Ninja Warrior. They actually have a gym um, where we are right now that, that is kind of the Ninja Warrior theme. And between that one and like the trampoline park gym place, you know, where they have all kinds of crazy trampolines, those are their two favorites. When it's not snowing, when it's snowing, they're on the slopes. But right now it's not snowing and they're loving all that stuff that you do so well. So how did you tell us about the biochemistry part? That's, I think, a lesser known part of you. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So when I went to college, I had originally told my mom that I wanted to be a trainer or something on those lines. You know, she said that wasn't really a real job. So then I started to re- rethink <laughs> of like what else I could be. And then she was like, I was thinking about doing physical therapy. And then they told me I had to work on dead people. I'm like, I'm out. Uh, and then the last one was, I told her I wanted to be like in the circus or something along those lines, Ooh. still not like, like a hundred percent now, not a job. So I started trying to think of what I loved and was just super interested in. And I had an amazing chemistry teacher in high school and he made it so fun. And I found it so fascinating, the things you can do with different compounds and a, a lot about, you know, just different parts that you can't actually see with the, like the naked eye. So I got really fascinated by that. So I'm like, all right, I guess I'll go to school for biochemistry. Um, <laughs> didn't realize how hard work that is. I mean, that's like taking all the crazy classes, all the maths, everything. But when I started to get, when I graduated, I started working at Brown University and it was actually really fun at first because I was doing a lot of organic chemistry. So actually making different compounds and then testing them 
um, for prostate cancer, which was really cool. So it's literally cooking. It's like cooking in the kitchen <laughs> situation, which is you really cool. a very special suit you had to wear probably. Right. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I mean, I had, I definitely had my laptop and goggles. Um, but then when I, you know, I, you know, I started like wondering like what else could I do? Cause I wasn't really feeling fully fulfilled with what I was doing. I didn't really feel, it's like, you know, when you just like, don't feel like you belong, like, I'm like, I don't feel like I belong here. Like I'm good at this, but like, I don't know if I actually belong here. So I then went into working for the pharmaceutical interest industry because you can make some really amazing money there. I was having issues trying to get into schools. I wanted to, to get a PhD. So I'm like, you know what, let me just try pharmaceuticals. And that's when I was working now large scale. So I was working with the giant tanks now that full breaking bad style, full hazmat suit, like <laughs> wrenching tanks. It, it, it just, again, it was just so unfulfilling because I did get into biochemistry to with, with the intention of trying to help people, but I felt like you couldn't really reach people with no matter what you were doing. So, um, the shift really happened when I started seeing that by me becoming healthier and getting fit for my competitions, eating better, establishing good habits, even on like an overnight shift, which is a really tough thing to do. I started seeing that other people were following. They was like, you know, it's like, I like legitimately was like an influencer, like not on Instagram, but in real life, they're like, Oh, she's eating right. Like, Oh, what are you eating? Oh, can I come on your run with you when you, you go on midnight? And I started realizing that like, I can make a greater impact, not here in my lab poke and goggles. So, um, yeah. again, really fun, really grateful for, I needed, I needed all those experiences in my lifetime. Um, but yeah, I just didn't fulfill me to actually impact the people the way I wanted to impact them. Yeah. Wow. So, so much there. I'm, I, you know, you found the light actually pretty early on, I would say humbly, I'm going to be turning 50 and I, this part of my career, I've been a physician for 20 years, but just recently I've decided to really kind of pivot and pursue the path of what we call, you know, integrative or functional medicine, which is really getting down to the root of all illness, which Western medicine has a couple of things really, really good. One is the emergency care that we provide. If you fall down and you dislocate your shoulder, I'm your guy. I'll pop it back in for you, or you're having an acute situation, whether an injury, heart attack, stroke, in the acute throes of it, the ERs of this country are amazing. And I worked there for 20 years. However, what really dawned on me was that, you know what, most of these things that people are coming to see me for in this emergency setting are actually preventable. Take heart disease, right? The number one killer. 90 plus percent of all heart disease is preventable. And we're just getting it wrong because we're not doing Angela's approach. We're not eating right. We're not moving our silly body every single day. We're not getting goofy, having fun. We're too stressed out. Like all these simple things that you're crushing it, showing people how to do, we're not doing enough of. So you found the light earlier than I did. Thank you for doing that. You're amazing. Tell us a little bit about like, so you were actually doing these fitness competitions concomitantly while working overnight in a lab. Like that's crazy. Yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, again, I had to really try and so when uh, that, well, I love saying the story because what people will say to me all the time, which I always argue with them, is they're like, "Well, you can just do fitness whenever because like your schedule, like you know, you don't have mm-hmm. obligations or whatever." I'm like, "No, no, no," but I did that. Like, you know, yeah. I I was in that, and I could have like most of those people in that overnight shift, I could have just let myself go. It was the easiest thing to do. Um, but I had a really pre plan and schedule and kind of play around with things. Like, was I going to work out after the overnight shift when I was exhausted? <laughs> Was I going to work out before, you know, and get some kind of movement in, you know, I started trying to understand that a little bit better. And I think that was, again, it, it didn't, it wasn't perfect at first. Like I didn't fully understand like how to do this and make this work. And I get, I was exhausted at a lot of points, but yeah, so I would do the fitness competitions. Um, and those were like every, maybe a couple of weeks on the, on the weekend that I would do them. So yeah, I would come in like exhausted and stuff like that um, with getting the competitions done. But yeah, a lot of it was really being disciplined, really setting myself a schedule to set myself up for success. Like if I didn't prep my meals, like I would have to go out in the middle of the night, which the only thing open was fast food and get fast food. But if I prep my meals, I had a healthy meal there right there waiting for me and it was delicious and I felt better and I didn't feel as tired. So, uh, I started recognizing these things. It really is. A lot of it is setting yourself up for success and knowing that you're going to have to play with it a little bit. Like, again, I did not get it perfect with training for my competitions while doing this overnight shifts. I mean, there was moments where I was like, I did way too much. I'm so tired. It was constantly just like a scientist kind of like reevaluating and looking at the data and understanding like what tweaks I can make in order to, to make this, you know, work for me. 
Wow. So, so much there. A lot of the listeners out there are moms. They have kids, they have busy life. And, and you just said something that I think they can apply tomorrow, which is that if you take a moment and just kind of plan ahead, it sounds a little daunting if you don't do like a meal plan or a weekly. I got six kids. And when we started to kind of meal plan, it simplified things a lot. Not only the trip to the grocery store, which is daunting enough, right? Trying to feed six kids for a week or two or three at a time, whatever that looks like, but to actually figure out what to buy and how to get the meals. If you plan, not only is it simpler, like you said, but you can actually get those meals that you know are healthy, plan for them, and then you won't be, you know, at risk for having to get fast food because that's the only thing that's available. Or, you know, you're at work and you're busy and you don't have time to do anything but run to the quick corner whatever it is, corner store, corner fast food, corner, you know, nowadays we have these different challenges, right? When you and I grew up, we didn't have as many fast food places as we do now. We didn't have all the options that we have now. And sadly, many of the options aren't very good ones, right? I, I, I'm curious, when you were doing the overnight thing, like what worked out, you know, you were the N equals one study that you tried all these different varieties of things. Listening right now are people who have to work that shift currently, the night shift. What worked out for you as far as when did you find was the best time to eat? When did you find was the best time to work out? What, what was your, your uh, experience there? It's tough for me to fully remember it, but I think that the, cause I mean, I definitely feel like I blurred out. Like, it, I mean, overnight shifts really <laughs> mess you up, I swear. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure what I went up doing is I got back at like, you get off the shift at 7am, but it took me still like 45 minutes to get home. So by the time I got to bed, um. And during the day, it was like 9 a.m. And I think I woke up from nine. I slept from nine to like two or three um, or tried to sleep. And then yeah. I'm pretty sure I went to the gym before because going after I was way too exhausted to even make it yeah. happen. So I did some kind of workout beforehand. And then, like I said, I had a break at midnight. So I'd always do something at midnight, some kind of movement that would also like keep me awake and kind of keep me going. So that's what worked best for me. And then like, as for the food, like you said, I had like pre-packaged, pre packaged pre pre-made stuff that I had made beforehand that I would bring in so yeah. I could like eat it up. Um, that was also really hard, right though. Cause you know, at that time, fitness comps, the coach wanted me to eat the six meals a day. So I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I literally can't like, I, I, I'm like, I actually can't because I'm literally hazmat suited in. I can't bring the food in the hazmat room all in there. So then I was experimenting with, okay, cool. Can I do like two bigger meals? And again, you can figure out what works for you. And I think also knowing that there's no one way to do it. So that's why it's like you're seeing someone do it one way and you try it and you're like, oh no, that is not going to work for me. That's totally cool. There's so many other ways that you can play with that's going to work best for you. Like maybe you, again, maybe you can't eat the six meals a day. Like some people wanted you to, okay, cool. What can you do instead? Can you do like two bigger meals? Like how can you get your food in, you know, things along those lines. So th yeah, that's definitely what I feel like worked for me again it's pretty blurry because like, i was pretty tired um but uh yeah definitely i think i worked out before because after i was like no chance yeah well especially if you're driving 45 minutes like thank goodness you made it home every day i i know personally when i would work i spent 20 years in the hospital mostly in the er and working overnight i struggled to even make it home i like you had a 45 minute commute and so I was just trying my best to get home safely. And then I would try to just jump right in bed and try to knock out as many hours as I could. You know, usually it wasn't the full eight because it just, you know, it's bright outside. The kids are making noise. I got all kinds of chaos in the background. I did my best. And then I also would try to do my movement sometime after that and before the next shift. I think what you said there, which was so critical, is that there's no one size fits all approach. We're all a little bit different. We all have to listen to our body. We have to figure out what works for us just because it may work for Angela or for me or somebody else doesn't mean it's perfect for you. However, there's some basic principles, right? There's eat real food. Try not to eat the stuff in the middle of the grocery store. It's got what I call the, the evil triad, right? The highly processed grains and sugars and- Eat and around the, the perimeter, like, like you eat around. Yeah, you just the shop around the perimeter. And what does that look like for you now? Before doing fitness competitions, I get that they wanted you to eat like six times a day. And that's kind of like for that specific goal. Now, what is your normal sort of like, give us a day in Angela's world. What does that look like for you? Your, your usual eating uh, habits or whatever. Yeah. So it's really different. I'm so happy I ate that way and did the way they, they told me, cause it taught me a lot about food and it taught me a lot about the portions and 
what I need in meals and why that's important. So I learned, I really got super educated from that process. That process was hundred percent not for me. Uh, it was, you know, trying to meal prep on Sunday for basically like four or five days. I always found that by the end of the week, my food would either go bad. Cause I was just like, I'm not, and I would be sick of it. So I noticed that like that style was not working for me. Um, it, it, yeah, it, I just went, I'm not eating it or throwing stuff out. And I'm like, I don't want to be doing that. So currently what I've been doing, I honestly, I get blue apron. So luckily like I'm single, so it's just me and myself. So when I get the blue apron meals, they're actually, you can split them into to two servings. So it's not like I get literally get two meals out of that one. And what I love about it is one, it's forcing me to, I work for myself now. So I actually need like some, something to pull me away from my work. Cause I love it so much. So I'm like, <laughs> all right. So it's forcing me to cook which is great. I don't have to cook every night, right? Because I can split the meals into two. Um, so I do the Blue Apron because I know that I'm not going to waste any food. There's all high quality, good ingredients. That's very hard right now to find is trying to understand like antibiotic free meat. Well, I'm like, it's so frustrating yeah. that we even have to do that. So yeah. I, it just comes to me like antibiotic free, good, good source, like, you know, from locally farmed things. So it literally just comes in the box, like ready to go. And I've literally never wasted anything. So, um, I'll cook that normally for like lunch, dinner type situation. Um, and then in the morning, I'm always having some kind of, you know, breakfast. So I, the only thing I have to go to the grocery store to buy is some kind of breakfast food. So it's normally either like um, eggs and some, I always have some kind of veggie and something along those lines. And I love potatoes. So like, I'll make that all in there. Or it could be, you know, pancakes, you know, maybe I want pancakes that morning, you know? So um I've gotten a lot more flexible, but what I do, do like to tell people is I did have to feel, I feel like I had to go through that journey of eating that healthier way and getting my body to a certain point that I can be fine on just having these three meals that I've created now. So like I said, it's so different for different people, but I feel like if I didn't go through that por portion where I was eating healthier and going through that sediment and getting my, again, my body at a certain point, I don't know if I would be able to do what I'm doing now. I might have to kind of rethink how I'm eating a little bit more, but now I just look at my plate. As long as I have my protein, some vegetables, um, some kind of carb, my body does very well with carbs. Some people are different and they have to change it up, but like my body like needs it. If I don't have it, I actually feel like tired and fatigued. So, um, carb. So as long as I look at my plate and I see all those things those ingredients, then I know that I'm headed in the right direction. Yeah. Wow. I, and you had, I mean, all the years of this very finely tuned, you know, eat exactly like this and that, and so I think you're right. That made you very flexible, metabolically speaking. So you can kind of handle whatever comes your way now. And, and you have the luxury now to kind of be able to have more options as far as you're not on the stringent, I should say. You're not on the stringent protocol. The protocol you're on is what Angela's on. She's on her journey. She's working for herself now. She doesn't have to show up for the 12-hour night shift or whatever that looked like. Like you have more options, which is amazing. And you've set yourself up very well for that. Um, a lot of people... Um, they, they look at this whole, like, let's say fitness thing is out of their reach, right? They're like, I don't have a gym membership. I don't even have any free weights at home. Like, where does the average person even start? What, how, do you, how do you work with that? What, what's your recommendation to just get moving and how do you approach that? Yeah, that's a great question because I think a lot of that is a lot of excuses. Yeah, <laughs> a lot agreed. of it is like, why can't I move? Instead of thinking like, what what can I do? And so you're thinking of like, what can I do and lack, and like instead of what can you do? Which, it, first of all, a few different things. Like one, you don't need to work out for like an hour. You really just don't. You just need to get something in. So maybe maybe that maybe that movement to you looks like you're just gonna go for a walk. It's just a walk. That's just, it's just movement. Get yourself in, just get yourself out and like go for that walk. Maybe that movement looks like for you that you're doing some core exercises for like 10 minutes on your floor. It doesn't have to take a long time. You don't need any equipment and it can get overwhelming. I think online by looking at your beginner journey and thinking that I think this is really, I get frustrated with sometimes with the fitness space because I feel like sometimes it is pushing people away because they're, they're like, you have to lift heavy and you have to do this. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care what you do, as long as you get yourself moving. So the first step is to get yourself moving and you don't need to make it fancy. You don't need equipment. You don't need anything. So I always tell people go back to the basics, um, and just work on that. I always make my clients do that. Um, I even have a, a program I made for that. It's called core revolution. And they literally just do it for 30 days. It's all core programs. 
They follow along, they're quick, they're easy, they're simple. And that really helps them build that foundation to whatever that next thing is that they're doing. So I think working on the real basic moves, you don't need to have any equipment. You don't need to have weight. Again, just set yourself up for the goal to get the movement in. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be perfect yet. Just get yourself in the groove. Then once you get in the groove and you're like, oh, I'm showing up now for myself and doing that, then maybe you can look into, oh, well, maybe I can start you know, using weights and doing that stuff. But the whole, if you're not moving at all, like that's, that's yeah. it's a lose, lose, right? <laughs> so just doing something, something, some kind of movement. And again, not putting that pressure on yourself to making it be this intense, crazy thing. It's just, just something I always have in my non-negotiable list every day. It says movement. And that movement sometimes is not in the gym. Like sometimes it's literally, like I said, a walk. It's literally just me, you know, hanging on my bar in my apartment and just, that's it for like a few minutes. It's just something, you know? Yeah. One, one thing I love about you is you always kind of bring back this focus on strength, strength being powerful, strength being beautiful. And a lot of my audience are women. And I think traditionally uh, for whatever reason, right, they have this like, belief that if they start working out, they're going to get muscular and less feminine and bulky. And personally, I haven't found that to be the case with those I've worked with. What do you say to that? And how do you approach that? Because strength yeah. is beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, that was really tough for me growing up because growing up, I was a, a gymnast growing up and strong was not beautiful at all then, like at all. And I, I had like a bicep, you know, so <laughs> They were literally calling me like Mangela. They were calling me the, all these names. So I literally hid my body for years. So strong was hundred percent, not beautiful to me. Yeah. And I can see how other people kind of thought that. I mean, I think it's just like our society kind of, you know, with, you know, looking at tall, skinny models and stuff along those lines, it kind of put this damper on people who have strength. Now, I think a lot of people are seeing how strong is beautiful and they do like, I have women coming to me. Oh, I want that defined arm or I want that. What I like to say is that one, it is extremely hard to get extremely mus muscular. You have to lift crazy heavy. You have to eat a shit ton. And it's honestly, it's, it's, it's definitely hard to get to that. Also, that obviously depends on like your body type and some other things, but it's, it's really hard to get that way. What I like to have people do is shift their mindset instead of worrying about what you're going to look like, whether that be getting skinnier, or getting too muscular and stuff like that, focus on just getting stronger and focusing on how that makes you feel. And in, a lot of times it makes you feel really damn good. Um, so I think if you can shift your, having people shift their perspective on the way they're seeing this is really important along their journey. And a lot of times they see when they just focus on getting stronger, like I'm very focused on helping people get their pull up when they're just focusing on getting their pull up, their body turns into like everything they wanted. They feel more confident. They're, they're, they're feeling amazing. That's actually what matters in the grand scheme of things. Not the whole, like, I'm going to get bulky. I'm going to get that. So I think that again, taking the time to really shift the perspective, I know it's really hard because we've just been conditioned as a society in a certain way to think a certain way about it. Um, but I've definitely tried to, you know, challenge that. <laughs> yeah. And everything you say is not only been borne out with, with, many, many people, thousands and thousands and thousands of data shows it. And the one thing that I found as we age, and we all care about staying functional, we want to be able to do stuff, right? We don't want to kind of go down this downhill path as we age. We want to keep being able to do the things we enjoy, whether it be going for a walk, a hike, picking up our children or grandchildren, or being able to grocery shop for ourselves and still be able to carry the bags, like whatever that function looks like. It's so important as we age to maintain and to even build muscle. You're familiar with this as we age. The path of least resistance is called sarcopenia. We lose muscle. We don't have to, though. We get to decide that. And, and I love what you said about the feeling of it. Like when you are strong, when you're able to say today you lifted whatever it is, you, you, know, you did a bench press and you did 50 pounds. And then like a month from now, you did 60 and then 70, whatever that looks like, like to feel that and like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like it just feels good. Strength feels good. So I love how you focus on that. That's so that, beautiful. That's actually, that's the name of my other program. It's called strong feels good. Cause, and what's cool oh. about it is, yeah. And as we were, as we, I was doing, as I created that program, I loved when people would come back to me and they're like, wow, strong really does feel good. And they're, that made me feel really good. Cause I'm like, that's my whole message. Like that's literally how I want you to focus. I love what you just said about the everyday life thing too so damn important. Um, I talk a lot about in my core program, 
certain, you know, movements that we're doing. And people are kind of like, why are we doing that? And I'm like, you don't understand that the function of your core is not to just be a six pack. It's that's not okay. Cool. That's what we think about. The function of your core is, is helping you with all the functions that you're doing. So one of the examples I told people was like, you know, when you're in your car and you have to reach behind you to go grab something, the amount of freaking times I'd have people come to me and be like, Oh, I threw out my back because I reached like that or hurt my whatever. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's literally why we're talking about having that strong foundation as much as it's about, again, I want the six pack muscles. The six pack muscles is not what makes up your core. It actually is made up of uh, all different areas. Right. And those are all ways to function in different ways. Uh, I also was teaching, um, anti-rotation core movement. So that's like a core movement where you have to keep yourself really still. Maybe you're moving your arm or something along those lines. And people are like, why are you doing this? Like, this doesn't do anything. I'm like, let's think about this. You're walking. It's a really slippery day. You slip. Oh my God, you eat shit. Right. But if you, if you had a stable core, you could readjust yourself. That's it right there. So it's interesting when you put like, I love how you put those everyday movements into there. Cause I think when people understand to why it's important by those everyday life examples. Cause as trainers, we can say all this mumbo jump, like we can say all this stuff, but when we, we relate it back to everyday life, people are like, Oh wow, actually you're right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah it was, it was the deconditioning that led them to throw out their back when they reached back to grab something or whatever. It wasn't, I mean, our bodies were built to do all kinds of interesting movements, right? I mean, we've always carried things. We've had to dig in the ground. We've had to climb things. I mean, just look at any kid when they're young, what are they doing? They're climbing everything. I got four boys and they climb not only trees, but basketball hoops and up the side of the house. And of course, in a climbing gym or on a rock or whatever, but they're just moving in all these directions. We were built for that. Right. And so getting back to where we can do those functions and the functions that will keep us alive and vital and independent. Right. I think we all want to be independent till the final days. We don't want somebody to care for us in a care home or any other place. We want to be able to do stuff. We want to do stuff. So that's what's so beautiful about what you're doing is you're teaching those important concepts and how to get stronger, feel better. And this is, this is great stuff. One thing I, I was curious about, and I, I don't know the answer to this with you, but do you ever work with kids or if you don't, what's your outlook on how we can as a society help our kids? Because right now, let's just face it, they do this a lot. I mean, oh, right now, the obesity rates in children is higher than it's ever been in the history of mankind, the history of time. It's horrendous. And so how do we help the kids? Yeah. So actually I did, I did use the work with kids because I used to teach gymnastics and my transition between biochem and opening my gym. The thing I did in between was I helped kids and then I would also train their parents because, you know, um, so I was really big on the conditioning and yeah, I think there's a couple different things. One, like you said, like ev- all, these kids are on their screen all the time. I'm so grateful that I feel like I'm at the right age where I grew up just at the right time where I didn't have that growing up. That wasn't a thing yet. They just started coming out with that stuff. So I still got to be outside and like do the, the actual fitness stuff and not be like tied to my iPad or my iPhone or whatever. And, and basically in like an alternate reality, like you're not actually like in like the now. Um So I think what's really important is honestly, you as an adult showing that that's cool and that like you're showing up for yourself. I had a bunch of, I used to, I used to own a gym, right? And a lot of, again, a lot of them were the parents of the kids that I used to train. And I had this one client, Allison, I'm very close with her and she was awesome. Her and I started, we got like, you know, you get real close to your clients. They become like your friends basically. So I'm like, you want to go like for just a run with me? Like whatever. She's awesome at running. So we're going for the run really super early in the morning. She's like, as she's running, she's like, you know what? My daughter came up to me the other day and she says, mom, I just want to let you know that I see you. Like, I see that you're showing up and you're getting up really early and you're getting your workout in before work. And even if they don't say it, like that she said, like her daughter said to her, they're noticing, right? And if you make it the cool thing to do and you make it like, oh, obviously we're doing this, they will follow along with it. So I think that's really important. If they see that you're not taking care of yourself, you're completely stressed out all the time, you're just running around and doing your work, they're going to think that that's okay. And that's how they should be. Like you really become, as I see as I grow up, like even my mom right now, my mom's like ridiculously stressed about certain things. And I'm like, well, I actually get like that sometimes. I'm like, cause I've been, I've seen that. That's what I grew up seeing. Right. So if they, if it really does start with the, the parents as the, for the kids, I believe like taking care of them. And it believes it sounds crazy because 
my client the other day had said like, I feel guilty sometimes showing it for myself. I'm like, no, no, no. Showing it for yourself is everything because right. they're going to see that and then they are going to want to do that. So I think finding a way to show how cool, like, how cool it is. Like movement is cool. This is, this is like what it should be. But again, I think right now they're being pushed in so many directions that aren't that because they're watching their, their parents just be stressed all the time and not showing it for themselves. They don't think that they need to do that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's powerful. And with kids, I agree 100%. I got six of them and they watch everything, everything. you do, everything you say. They're like little tape recorders. Like they could quote you on stuff, which is a little bit scary. I'll be honest, but <laughs> the doing part is really important. And I know my kids see me, they see my wife. She's crazy fitness fanatic. When, when you meet here, you're going to be like, Oh my gosh, like you think I'm energetic. She's like, to I the nth that. power above me energetic. She's like off the And that you're ages, right? Her. <laughs> and, and like you yeah. said, you both are in your 50s. Like that's incredible for them to see that, you know, at 50 years old, you ever see that picture of like the two, it's, I don't know if it's the two 60 year olds next to each other and they both look completely different. Like one is like with the cane hunched over and the other one like looks totally fine. It's because that's the difference right there. It's like, you don't have to be the person with the cane, like in the hospital, whatever. If you, like you said, you were saying before, if you just, take care of yourself now, like release the guilt, take the time. You have the time. Again, it doesn't have to be an hour. You, you do have the time right now to make it happen. And again, it can just be something. And maybe you're showing up for yourself too at first isn't every day. Maybe the showing up for yourself is literally taking that five minutes to just take like some breaths and just breathe and de-stress. Right. Cause that's also a huge piece of what's happening right now with people. I just went to a conference. I talked about all this with mental health and stress and, you know, that stress is releasing all this cortisol and it's, it's, it's messing up every, it's literally aging you faster. And they had this experiment again, love experiments. It was all like for neural and stuff like that. So they showed all the brains and like how this is working, but they'd shown that the, it was like the biological age of somebody was like 10 times the age that they were or whatever. And then when they finally took the time to start taking care of themselves and within one month that dropped by like five years. So they like, it does scientifically, like you were saying, it actually it's, it's all true. Yeah. Well, I, I love the last part, especially what you said that how quickly these things can actually change. And that's like where I really want people to understand that like this stuff can literally turn things around in a matter of days and weeks. It doesn't have to take years. Like we're not planning to be Olympic athletes. Most of us, right? 99.9999% of us are not planning to be Olympic athletes and that's okay but we can literally change our metabolic state, our overall health in the matter of days to weeks. It doesn't take a long time. With these simple choices that you're saying, the one thing that I wanna just reiterate, especially for the moms out there, there's a lot of mom guilt sometimes, right? Like if I go to this like workout class or I go for this walk or run and it takes 30 to 60 minutes, whatever it takes, like we start to, I think as parents, sometimes we feel bad, but I think if we take the view that you just shared that our kids will see that this stuff matters to us, not only do we benefit, but they benefit. I mean, it's, it's huge and it is generational because right now, look at the, the kids coming up, right? They, as well as the parents right now in the US, we have the highest obesity rate we have ever had in adults and children, right? And it doesn't have to be like that. We have the best technology. We have so many things available. We got Instagram and we can watch you teach us things. Like we have so many things that are fingertips literally and yet we're the least healthy we've ever been in the history of mankind. I think it's it crazy. also starts with, you know, the, there needs to be a change in some kind of thing that's going on here, especially in the U S there has to be a change. Yeah. The fact that I go to the grocery store and I have to get pay extra for the antibiotic free, better <laughs> quality meat is disturbing to me yeah. because they should, they should all be that way. All yeah. of them. That should not be something we have to to pay extra for or have to dig to find and stuff like that. So they, these things should be more readily available. So it's it's a little frustrating. So I think that if we really want to see huge, like bigger change, we need to kind of turn into more what Europe's doing with their food. There's a lot of things that if you see their list of ingredients that is not allowed because they're not good <laughs> for our body, it's a book. It's a legit yeah. book. You see the US, it's like a page. Um, yeah. and that's frustrating. Yeah. That, that all comes down to like money and other stuff. So it's like frustrating, but yeah, with, with the mom situation too, it's like that literally the mom I had was talking to the other day was I'm feeling guilty because I'm getting extra sleep and I'm doing some stuff for myself. I'm like, no, 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 no. I was like, 
by <laughs> you doing that, everybody else wins. You have to keep reminding yourself. And it's just like they say on the airplane every time, like you need yeah. to put the mask on yourself. Cause if you don't put the mask on yourself, you cannot put the mask on your six other kids. Like you won't be yeah. able to do that. You have to do your stuff first. You'll be, you'll be hypoxic and not thinking straight. Yeah. Put your oxygen on first hundred percent all day long. <laughs> it's an, extreme, it's an yeah, extreme example, but you know, sometimes yeah. people need to hear it in that way. Cause you're like, yeah. Oh, actually like that makes sense. You know? Yeah. And if we keep doing these things, like you said, if we, as literally a country and a people, we refuse to buy the really bad stuff process. I hate to say bad stuff, but the, the poor quality stuff, the highly processed stuff and the stuff that has antibiotics and hormones and all that. If we just refuse to buy it, guess what's going to happen over time? The other stuff, which is the better stuff, the better quality, no antibiotic, the no hormone, the grass fed and finished, the pasture raised, all that stuff is actually going to start to outweigh and be more prominent and be less expensive. But we have to vote with our feet. We have to be that, you know, starting point. We have to, we have to do it ourselves and then it'll, it'll just steamroll. It'll just get more available and more doable and more, you know, less expensive, all that good stuff. So I have to ask you about the pull-up thing. I, I, I personally, and I told you this offline, I love pull-ups. I don't know why I just, something weird about me. I, when I was, when I was a kid, I bought one of these, like in those days, we didn't have the portable ones that we could just hang up over the doorway. We actually had to like screw in into the side of the door jam and then the thing would like lift up and lift out. So my parents liked it because they wouldn't hit their head on it because I could take it out, but then I could put it back in and use it whenever I wanted to. And I liked it so much that when I turned 19, I went out of the country. I lived uh, in Guatemala for two years and I brought this silly little pull-up bar with me. And you might laugh or the people out there might laugh, but I literally brought this so-called portable pull-up bar with me. For two years, I carted this thing around in my suitcase. Everything, everybody thought I was crazy, but everywhere I went, I just hung up this pull-up bar because I didn't have any weights. I had no way to really stay fit other than I did walk a lot, but I've always loved pull-ups. So what's the story with you and pull-ups? And, and I know it's kind of like, for me, it's almost a metaphor of life and you've worked with a lot of people with this, but tell us your story about the pull-up. Yeah, absolutely. I, first of all, I love the fact that you carried around the pull-up bar. I like that's absolutely amazing. I had another client who literally did that also. It was... <laughs> freaking awesome to watch her do it. I'm like, I'm like, I freaking love it. I'm into it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think where the pull-up came about for me was it, it was less about me. Honestly, it was really more about the people that I was helping. And what I noticed is that every time I told people that I was a ninja warrior, they came up to me, Oh my God, you're an American ninja warrior. They're like, I just wanted to be able to do a pull-up literally every time they're like, Oh, well, I'm never going to be an ninja, but I'd love to just be able to do a pull up. And I was like, all right, cool. Like what's stopping you? Like, let's make it happen. So I started helping these females and a lot of them, like we had talked about before, my, my clientele is much older. So it's like, yeah, it's like 35 to 65 situation. Um, they'd always said, well, I I'm too old now. Right. To like do that. I'm like, no, you're not no chance. You're not too old to get it. You're never too old. Um, so we just started breaking it down step by step. And I started watching this transformation of them getting their, their pull up and, you know, starting off pretty defeated, looking up at that bar, like, how is this going to happen? This is never going to happen. And then getting that slight bend in the elbow, whoa, getting a little excited about it, right. Getting a little bit more oh, amazing. And then all of a sudden getting all the way up and the reaction I got was interesting for myself. Cause I was like, very, obviously I wanted them to, to get the skill like anybody does, but it was the confidence I saw on them after that, the confidence that, wow, I just did this thing that was really damn impossible, but I showed up, I got up there and then you start to see what, what can I do two now? Oh, can I do three? And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, but maybe I can run that marathon or maybe I can swing a kettlebell now. So your confidence really starts to come out of it. And like you had said with, you know, with life in general, it a hundred percent is, it was and I, I literally interviewed um, Liz Foster, the editor of Women's Health. I helped her get her pull up. And she did 15 the other day, by the way. Amazing. It went from literally nothing to she's doing 15 wow. now. And she, wow. we had this talk about it. It was way, you think it's about the pull up until you get it. And then you realize it has nothing to do with the pull up. It's literally, that's your life journey right there in that pull up. You are starting from the bottom with your feet on the ground. Like how the hell is this going to happen? And then you have the ups and downs. You have the days where you're like, oh my God, like, I'm crushing it. And then you have the days where you're like, I suck again, crushing it, but you're still going up. And that's just like life, right? As long as you keep showing up, you are moving the needle and you are going up and you will eventually get to wherever you want to be. And the quote I always told them is like, it's not a matter if you're going to get it, it's when you're going to get it. 
but you have to show up and be persistent. And that persistence of learning that pull up, you, it translates into all parts of your life. So I think it's pretty cool. The confidence that I saw from them getting pull-ups. And then when I looked around, I started looking online and I started noticing, and this is way before online was cool, by the way. So I've had my program for a very long time. Um, but I was like, there's nothing out there that isn't intimidating for a female, especially there was nothing, nothing out there. And I could see why it was so hard for them to show up. You know, you see these muscular guys showing you drills and stuff and all this, you know, some of these insane women, but they didn't have a friendly approach to it to show up. So my goal was to help these females get the pull up, to change their perspective on it, make it way less intimidating, make it exciting and make it fun. And, you know, it's just so much more than just getting the pull up. And again, I just feel like that passion you have for, you know, I can do plenty of pull ups, but it's not about me. Like, I don't really care how many pull ups I can do. It's about them getting their pull ups. So I was so funny. I went through all my videos the other day and like going through all the before and afters. And I'm amazed by because the time flew really quickly. I've had this program for years. I'm going through literally hundreds of before and after pull-ups. I'm like, this is freaking <laughs> cool. Like, this is really cool. And that's why it's called pull-up revolution. It's literally a revolution. Like, yeah. I want to get everybody to be doing their pull-up. <laughs> that, well, I, I love how it's literally kind of a metaphor for life. I mean, there's so many people you've helped that their entire life have never been able to do one pull-up. And now they can do a pull-up and maybe a couple and what else can they do now right now they believe that they can do great things with their body and their mind like that's beautiful yet it's pretty simple too but it takes that consistency the deter- deter- determination and showing up like you said i mean it's wow that's, it's easy. that's like that, that, that pull-up that these these the people who get their pull-up i mean they're working they're there every day they're there on the good days or they're in the bad days they're having frustrating moments they're having great moments like it's and that's a hundred percent, like we were saying about life, like y- you have to keep showing up, especially on the days where you don't want to, especially on the days where you're just freaking like, this is never going to happen. I always found <laughs> it always happened, right? When they were getting really frustrated and like annoyed, I'm like, you hold on a little bit longer. I'm like, remember this moment? Cause you're going to get it in the next couple of days now, because it's always when you want to give up and you're right at that cusp of, I'm just going to give up on this, that something happens. Every time, every time, yeah. every, and that this has gone with so many things in my life. Uh, one of the stories that's interesting, it's not a pull up story, but I'd wanted to get on the cover of a magazine. I put it on my vision board 2015 and man, I went, I was crazy. I was like emailing people, doing all this <laughs> stuff, getting myself in front of these people, doing all this stuff for years. And finally, I, uh, you know, I'd gone in magazines and finally, you know, I think it was like, yeah, 2020. I was like, you know what? Like, whatever. like I'm just. I'm over this. Like, this is just not going to happen for me. It's fine. I'm okay with it. And then just when I was about to give up, you know, I get the call. Okay, cool. You have a cover. Like, it's insane. It's insane. Like, so like, I think that if you can remember right now, if you're having a moment like that right now where you're sitting there and you're like, oh my God, like just hold on a little longer, (laughs) a little longer. (laughs) A little. Yeah. No, they, like they say, right. The cliche, the night is darkest right before the dawn, you know, it's just that last, just hang on. Just hang yeah. on a little bit more, a couple more days, a couple more attempts. You're going to get there. Like, uh, and the vision board thing. That's, that's so awesome. I think we just, in our minds, we have to believe that we can do it. We have to visualize that we can get there and do that pull up. And if we just keep that small little bit every day, the momentum, eventually we're going to get there. Not only with pull ups, but with whatever we want to achieve in life. Right. I mean, what a, what a beautiful metaphor. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I love and it. So, yeah. so when I talk about it, I'm like, I love it. It's so great. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's awesome. Well, I want to be respectful, Angela, of your time. And uh, is there any kind of parting thoughts you want to share? And then after which, you know, just tell us how we can uh, connect with you, how we can get your pull-up challenge and all the amazing stuff you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the the biggest parting, the biggest thing that I'm seeing come up so much lately is that people don't believe in themselves right now. So they kind of like get paralyzed. And they don't want to get started in anything. So my friend that always has this quote, it's like, do before you believe. So yeah. just do before you believe, before you even know what the hell you're doing before, just, just do whatever that is. And that be with exercise, that be with like a goal that you've been like kind of putting off to the side, 
just do now. And you're probably not going to believe in yourself until later, honestly. Um, and that's, and that's okay. Um, so I think that's a, a, a big piece of what I've been seeing happen, like with a lot of my clients and people around me lately. Um, and yeah, ways to contact me, um, best way is Instagram, honestly, um, at Angela underscore Gargano. And I love, you know, when people send messages, like if you listen to this podcast episode and you're like, wow, that really resonated. And you like to share your story. I always tell people like, send me the message. I read all of them. Like, this is what Uh, I love. This is what I love to hear. Um, and I'm, thank you so much for having me on. This is a great conversation. I love talking about this stuff. So it was great. Uh, no, thank you. And it's been just amazing. It's been a pleasure. It's been a gift, I think, to all of us today. And, you know, when I was a kid, we used to say, fake it until you make it. I like your version a little better. Same message, but, but I think it's, it's, it settles a little bit better. I mean, we want to believe. You just have to do first because you won't necessarily believe you can do it at first. You just got to start doing. Just start moving. Start doing it. And you'll get there. The belief will come. I could not agree more. Thank you, Angela. Angela Gargano in the house. So grateful for you. It's been amazing, as we say in Hawaii, a big aloha to you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on any future episode. And I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. If there's any topic you'd love to hear about, you're dying to know, burning questions, please comment below and let me know what future topics are of interest to you.